Please turn off your phones. One last try. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is David Gibson. I'm 13 years old. In February of last year, I was diagnosed with undifferentiated umbilical sarcoma of the liver. My doctors found a five-pound mass on my liver. I had a central port installed to begin aggressive treatment to shrink the tumor to a manageable size for surgery. Eventually, they were able to remove the right lobe of my liver. After another couple rounds of chemo in December, my cancer was officially declared in remission. Hi, I'm Jacob Gibson. I'm 14 years old, and I'm David's older brother and super sib, which basically means I'm the sibling of, of an Alex's hero. My mom, brother, and I got involved with Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation by volunteering at Alex's original Lemonade Stand in Penn Wynn last year. We were excited to be a part of an organization that is trying to give a part trying to give hope to families like ours by funding research for better treatments and cures. And we are all excited for you to hear from Dr. Jeffrey Waugh and understand how his exciting work is advancing the field of childhood cancer research in retinoblastoma. But first, I would like to introduce to you Jay Scott, co-executive director of Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation and Alex's dad. Here he is to tell you about the amazing things that the foundation and its supporters are doing to find a better cures and impact treatments. Come on up, Jay. Thank you. Good evening. So Alex was my daughter. She was diagnosed with cancer just before her first birthday. And she fought it for seven and a half years until she passed away when she was eight and a half. A lot happened in those eight and a half years, though. But even more has happened because of those eight and a half years. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those eight and a half years and what happened because of them tonight. So she was diagnosed just a couple days before her first birthday. We lived in just outside um, Hartford, Connecticut. And uh, we went to Boston for a second opinion. We went to New York City for a third opinion. And the amazing thing was we had three different opinions on how to treat her cancer, which was neuroblastoma. Believe it or not, Liz and I. Liz and I were in our 20s, much younger than we are now. Um, but we had to decide how to treat her. So over the next three years, she had surgeries and chemotherapy, more surgery, more chemotherapy, more surgery, more chemotherapy, until we got to a point where all three hospitals agreed on how we should be treating her. And they agreed that we should, be, we should stop treating her and we should take her home and let her enjoy her few remaining days outside the hospital because she was going to die. But we had one doctor that told us that he thought that there might be a doctor in Philadelphia that could help her. And so we made a call to the doctor in Philadelphia, let him know about Alex's condition to see if he thought that he had anything that he could offer us. And so the first time we came to Philadelphia, we came down for an experimental treatment. It was the first of many experimental treatments that Alex had. And it was a pretty scary treatment. At the time, she was really sick. She had cancer as high as her neck, as low as her left foot, and a lot in between. And she was in so much pain that she was on morphine 24 hours a day. And so we came down for this experimental treatment that required her to be in a lead room. So the walls are lead, the ceiling's lead, the floor is lead. And she had to be in that room in isolation. Just one of us could go in at a time until she was no longer radioactive. And they injected her with this injection uh, of liquid, and it was called radioactive iodine. And she had to stay behind a lead shield until she was no longer radioactive. That took about three days. But you can imagine, as a three, almost four-year-old, how scary that was. After three days, they said that she could go home. And she said a couple of things that really changed our life. She said that treatment worked. And when she was asked about what she meant that the treatment worked, she said, I could tell by the way I feel. And then she said she wanted to go shopping for a Christmas dress. And this is a kid that was on morphine 24 hours a day, three days before, now asking to go shopping for a Christmas dress, and she was completely off of pain medicine. So we went back to Connecticut. They did an MRI of her, 
and they said, wow, she has less cancer in her than she's ever had. That treatment worked. She still had a little bit of disease in her spine, but she had less disease than she ever had. It was cleared up in her bones. It was cleared up in her neck. And so they put back on the schedule a, a treatment that they had previously called off, and that's called a stem cell transplant. Um, you've probably heard of a bone marrow transplant. It's similar uh, to a bone marrow transplant, except they take your own cells and they give them back to you um, during the transplant. And so it was during this transplant that she came up with this crazy idea that she wanted to have a lemonade stand. And when she first asked about having a lemonade stand when she got out of the hospital, she was told, it's January, we live in Connecticut, probably not such a great idea. <laughs> but she kept asking about it. First it was like once a month, she got out of the hospital in a month, she, then it was once a week, and then it seemed like it was every day. And so when she was finally asked, Alex, what toy do you want to buy? Because we can just buy you the toy. You don't need to have a lemonade stand to make the money. She said, oh no, I don't want to keep the money. I want to give it to the doctor so they can come up with treatments like the one I got in Philadelphia. So it, it, that treatment did something to her. It put something in her mind where she thought she could make a difference if she gave the doctors money. And so we teased her a little bit and said, you're going to give them a check for five or ten dollars and, and think that they're going to be able to come up with treatments. But we let her do it. And so that first lemonade stand that she set up in our front yard, a lot of people came. They came, some of them were crying, some of them were smiling, most of them had a story to tell her. But at the end of that day, she had raised over $2,000. Pretty good lemonade stand, right? For those of you that have had one before. We delivered the money to the hospital, and Liz and I didn't think much about it after that. But Alex must have been thinking about it, because in the meantime, we moved down to Philadelphia to be closer to the hospital here. Alex started talking about setting up the lemonade stand again. She set up another lemonade stand in our front yard, and amazingly, she raised over $12,000 in one day. Caused a traffic jam in our neighborhood. I think the police said, can you guys tell us when she's gonna have a lemonade stand again and we'll have somebody out there to direct traffic, okay? Um, we gave the money to the hospital. The next year came around, she started talking about setting up a lemonade stand again. And in the pouring rain, she raised over 18,000. It rained so much that our yard was ruined from people trampling the grass. I mean, I don't know if there was hundreds or thousands of people that were coming to get lemonade from her, um, but $18,000. And it was after that lemonade stand an amazing thing started happening. She started getting letters from all over the country and around the world from people. And the letters would always kind of say the same thing. Alex, we heard about what you were doing. We read it in the newspaper. We saw you on TV. And we decided to do our own fundraiser and here's the money that we raised. And you could say what you want about the post office, but we would get letters in our front door every day, you know, sometimes stacks of them, and sometimes they would just be addressed, the Lemonade Girl, United States, or Alex's Lemonade, Pennsylvania, with no street address, and somehow the post office would find us. So we would open the mail every day, and Alex would read the letters, but she's still fighting her cancer, and the cancer was starting to win. And so as she turned eight, she was doing an interview with a reporter, and she told the reporter this. She said, last year my goal was to raise $100,000 with the lemonade stand, and I did it. So this year I'm gonna raise a million dollars. How do you raise a million dollars with a lemonade stand? I said, Alex, you realize you set up a lemonade stand in our front yard. She said, I think if people continue to help me, I think we can do it. And within about six weeks of her making that statement, she was at $700,000. And she hit her million. She died a couple of weeks later. We think she was holding out to hit the million. The story could have ended there, but it didn't because the outpouring from people was even greater after she died than when she was alive. So if you fast forward to today, Alex's Lemonade, we funded about 600 projects, maybe raised 120, 130 million dollars. None of that matters if the money's not making a difference. So I want to tell you guys a little bit about some differences that the money has made. Okay, imagine this. You have a child with cancer, and the cancer comes back. They've relapsed. It's neuroblastoma. You don't know what to do for treatment. We just funded a project that is going to start a new clinical trial where for neuroblastoma, relapse patients, they're going to do a biopsy of the patient because the cancer has changed when it relapses than when it, from when it started. And after that relapse, they do the biopsy, 
and they do the genomics testing on it, and they customize the treatment for every single patient. And so we think with this clinical trial, they're going to have treatments for 70 to 80 percent of the kids that relapse. And this will be a customized treatment. And the important thing about that is they know um, with better precision what might work. And almost as important, they know what's not going to work, and they don't give the kids those treatments that don't have a chance at working. Because chemotherapy is poison. We try to give the kids as little amount as we can that will work, but you don't want to give them stuff that's not going to work at all. And so that is one thing that's going to give these families hope. And um, we're really excited about that trial to get up and running. And if it's successful, then it will expand to other cancers. Imagine this. You have a child that has cancer and there's no treatment available. And the doctor calls you and says, we're opening up a phase one clinical trial and we want your child to enroll on it. Phase one clinical trial typically is just to figure out what the right dose is for the, for the drug. What's the maximum dose they can give? Well, we know two families that were involved in a clinical trial. One girl had neuroblastoma. She was about the age of Alex when the doctors told us there were no treatments that would work. And another boy had lymphoma. And because of this project, these kids went on this trial just trying to figure out what the right dose was. This is the amazing thing. It was a pill, no IVs. It didn't make them lose their hair. It didn't make them feel sick. They didn't have to stay overnight in the hospital. So this one girl gets it. She gets one round of the, of the chemotherapy. And when she goes and gets a scan, the radiologist says to the oncologist, the surgery went remarkably well. And the oncologist calls the radiologist and says, this patient didn't have surgery. Can you make sure you're looking at the right scan? And they double checked and it was. The cancer was gone. They weren't even expecting it to work. Okay, that's amazing. That's like the holy grail. So Edie, who's the girl with neuroblastoma, and Zach, who had lymphoma, they were on the treatment for five years and the cancer didn't come back. And Edie, I've heard, just went off the treatment and they're gonna see if the cancer will stay away. One more story I wanna tell you about a project that we funded. This was a crazy idea. We funded it about 10 years ago. Maybe some of you saw it on the news uh, about a month ago. Okay, this guy had this idea that he could take the polio virus. We all get a vaccine for polio. He had this idea that he could take the polio virus and convince the body that their cancer was polio and that it would fight on its own the cancer. So imagine you have a kid with a brain tumor that's relapsed and there's no treatment options. And the doctor says to you, we have a treatment that we think might work. We've never given it to a person before, but it works really well in mice. What do you do? If you have no treatment options, you opt for it. So Stephanie was the first human that got this treatment. And when they started the treatment, her tumor was about the size of a lime, and they injected this deactivated uh, polio virus into her tumor. She got really sick, really sick. And then after about two weeks, she started feeling a little bit better, and a little bit better, and a little bit better. And when they did a scan of her head, the tumor had shrunk to like a, the size of a raisin. So they, they thought, well, it worked pretty good, but there's still a little piece of tumor there. It hasn't changed. It's been four or five years. It's still the same. They think it's just dead tissue. They can't check it because it's in the middle of her brain. She went away to college. She became a nurse. She's an oncology nurse, and she wants to become a pediatric oncology nurse. So those are some of the amazing things that we've been able to accomplish with, with Alex's Lemonade. And I would say childhood cancer is a puzzle. Alex's Lemonade is a piece of the puzzle but we're gonna keep going until the puzzle is totally done. So, thank you. Thank you, Jay. We always enjoy hearing you speak about Alex and how supporters everywhere are following in her footsteps. One million dollars. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Liz Scott. Liz is co-executive director of Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation and Alex's mom. She's here to tell us what's next for Alex's and what their formula for a cure is. Let's welcome Liz.
When I think about the future of Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation, in many ways, I feel like the future is not that different than the past. Not that different from Alex's simple wish when she opened her first lemonade stand. She wanted to help doctors find cures for all kids with cancer. Think about it, that's a pretty simple wish. Very straightforward, incredibly sweet, especially coming from a four-year-old. Yet at the same time, we know it's not simple to cure childhood cancer. It's an aspirational goal at best and a huge complex problem to solve at worst. Some might even say it's an impossible vision, an impossible dream, one that only a four-year-old could imagine was possible. Well, I'm here to tell you it is possible. In fact, modern medicine is filled with procedures and therapies that were no doubt deemed too complex and yes, impossible at one time. X-rays, MRIs, organ transplants, even blood transfusions, to name just a few. If that doesn't convince you, if you're still a skeptic and you're thinking, well, yes, but childhood cancer is different, then I ask you to think about this. In 1975, just 50% of children diagnosed with cancer would survive. Today, that figure is around 80%. So for the glass half full types of people, that is a very hopeful statistic because it shows us that we can solve childhood cancer with the right approach and the right resources, we can find more cures and better cures and increase survival rates. It has been done, it is not impossible. Now for those glass half empty folks, 80% survival is a very sad statistic. One out of five of our children in this country diagnosed with cancer will not live more than five years. In fact, childhood cancer is the number one disease killer of children in our country. And let me tell you, that is a very scary statistic when it's your child who's been diagnosed with cancer or when you are the child facing those odds. Another glass half empty viewpoint is that for some types of childhood cancers, we have not made nearly enough progress. Neuroblastomas, sarcomas, any relapsed cancers, high-risk leukemias, brain tumors, to name just a few. So I was always told you're either a glass half full or a glass half empty kind of person. But somehow, at Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation, we've managed to be both. We see the positives and the possibilities. We are not afraid to dream big, huge, seemingly impossible goals. After all, our founder Alex taught us that. But at the same time, we see the gaping holes in treating our children every single day. We know firsthand the challenges, the sense of failure, and the desperation that goes along with not being able to cure a child. We see the need for so many improvements in the childhood cancer community, better, less toxic treatments, fewer relapses, more options for cures when children do relapse, better resources for survivors and their families, and a much deeper understanding and awareness of the impact of childhood cancer on the whole family. The list goes on and on. So where does that leave us? Well, we believe that ALSF is in a unique position right now to bring together those two perspectives the optimist's hope of smart investments in research and programs with the pessimist's sense of urgency that drives us to want to do more, we have to do it better and we have to do it faster for these kids. So how are we gonna do that? Well, we will continue to focus on filling gaps in funding and resources. We've always grown our programs, not by looking at what is currently happening and working and trying to do more of that, but by looking at what's not currently happening and asking how can we make it happen. This means we continue our current, and I might say amazing grant programs. We will continue to fund everything from early innovative research and young investigators to clinical trials and first in children biological therapies, all exciting stuff. It also means we will continue our family support programs, programs like Super Sibs that provide comfort and care to siblings, the quiet victims of childhood cancer our free treatment journal for caretakers, and the Travel for Care program, which provides financial support for families who need to travel for treatment. In fact, we recently expanded this program to be available at every institution in the country that treats children with cancer. 
so that no family will have to let finances determine if they can give their child the best chance for a cure. These programs have been successful, and we're proud of the impact that we've made, but we know we have a long way to go. Over the years, we keep asking and asking, what are we missing? What else can be done? How can we make a bigger difference, and how can we make it faster? There are no shortage of ideas, that's for sure. But as we all know, there is a shortage of resources and funds. So, what else can we do? Well, in response, I'm happy to share that Alex's Lemonade Sam Foundation is going full force ahead. We are challenging ourselves to grow from a $20 million a year organization to a $50 million a year organization by the year 2020. How are we going to do that? Well, it's pretty straightforward. We're going to keep doing what we do, engage with our donors, increase our lemonade stands, build our other events like Alex's Million Mile, work with companies of all sizes, and ramp up our Kids Helping Kids approach so that kids all across the country can see that their efforts can have an impact on their classmates and their communities. I could spend a lot of time talking about how we plan to grow, but that's not nearly as important as talking about why we need to grow. It's not about growing so we can brag or be the biggest. We are growing because that's what it will take to cure all children with cancer and to do it as quickly as possible. I believe we are at an historic time in the study of childhood cancer. The way researchers are exploring the disease is more collaborative, more targeted, and smarter than ever before. The use of new technologies in diagnosing and treating children with cancer is unprecedented. The ability for us to learn about each child as an individual, not just a disease type or subcategory, is a game changer. That's why we need to ramp up our efforts. To borrow a phrase I recently heard from one of my son's teammates at halftime of a high school game, he said, guys, we are doing well, but we need to put the pedal to the metal and finish this now. I should note that they did finish it and won the state championship. So how can we at Alex's Lemonade Stand finish it? How can we put the pedal to the metal? We believe it's crucial that in addition to our current and amazing grant programs, we have to seek out and direct funding to new areas of critical need, ones that aren't currently covered by our current grant programs. Let me give you a few examples. We recently funded a project called PPTC, the Pediatric Preclinical Testing Consortium. This is a National Cancer Institute project, and the goal of it is to rapidly identify new therapies that have significant activity against childhood cancers. So basically what they do is bring together researchers to test drugs against tumors that have been genomically categorized. Well, after speaking with the NCI about investing in this more, we learned that they were only testing the drugs against a limited number of childhood cancer tumors because they didn't have them all categorized. So we proposed to them, can we give you funding so that you can categorize more childhood cancer tumors? And of course, their answer was yes. With the funding from Alex's, they're now able to categorize another 263 pediatric cancer tumor models. This one-time investment will allow them to evaluate the new drugs against all of those tumors, which is much more efficient and impactful for our kids. We also told them that we would require with our funding that the genomic sequencing and the samples be available free of charge to any researchers who wanted to use them in the future. Another example that we're addressing is the lack of progress for those very hard to cure childhood cancers. We're gonna be driving and initiating large scale projects to move the needle for low cure diseases. The first disease we plan to tackle is DIPG, an essentially incurable brain tumor. Later this year, we will be announcing a multi-million dollar grant for a collaborative research project that will lead to new treatments for this devastating disease. Another example, something we're super excited about, is focusing on the use of big data to inform and drive research. Believe it or not, the childhood cancer research community does not have a dedicated independent center to analyze existing science. In response, we plan to open the ALSF Data Lab in 2017. This is really exciting. We will hire computational biologists, informatics specialists who can analyze and organize data so that researchers can use it to inform their research, find new targets, and develop new cures for our kids. 
This will be the first of its kind informatics lab dedicated to childhood cancer, sharing its discoveries to advance the pace of cures. It's all about the kids. As you can probably tell, I'm pretty excited about the future for children with cancer. We should celebrate the progress that has been made and not take away from that, but we cannot lose sight of the fact that we still have work to do, and we are definitely up for the challenge. I hope you all are too. We will not stop until the day we finish what Alex started, the day we can say that we reach that simple but seemingly impossible goal, cures for all children with cancer. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. We always enjoy hearing you speak with passion about kids and what we're inspired and excited for the future. Future. Finally, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Hugh from John Hopkins University School of Medicine. In 2014, Alex Alumni Stand Foundation awarded him a Young Investigator Grant to research retinoblastoma. Dr. Hugh and two of his mentors, also previously supported by the foundation, recently wrote a fascinating report on relapsed T-cell le leukemia, for which there are almost no treatment options. Dr. Hugh has made exciting progress on treating patients with this type of disease. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hugh. Once upon a time, there was a very brave and generous girl named Alex. And she decided she wanted to help other kids with cancer. And thousands of other volunteers, thousands of you, helped her do it. Tonight, I have the honor and privilege to tell a couple of stories about the difference all of you are making for the kids that we all hope want to serve. So my story begins a little bit outside Detroit, where I was born and raised. I did my MD-PhD at the University of Michigan, my residency at WashU in St. Louis, and then came to Johns Hopkins and the National Institutes of Health to do my fellowship in pediatric oncology. My research has been in the laboratory of Elias Ambedis, another pediatric oncologist who is also a stem cell engineer. In 2014, I had the privilege of being promoted from fellow to faculty at Johns Hopkins. As many of you are familiar, in this age of very tight NIH funding, that jump from fellow to faculty is extraordinarily difficult. Into that funding gap has stepped a number of foundations, ALSF leading them. Thanks to the ALSF, they made possible my chance to become a member of the faculty at Johns Hopkins and the chance to continue my research. In fact, almost one out of every three professors at Hopkins today are ALSF awardees. Investigators like my friends Brian or Stacy, who, like me, had the chance to join the faculty because of the generosity of all of you. Or senior investigators who have been able to start brand new projects in revolutionary new fields because of the funding the ALSF made possible. What I'd like to do is to spend a couple of moments telling some stories of the actual kids that the foundation has been able to help through the application of science to the development of new cures. This is Grace. Grace is not her actual name, of course, but her family has very generously let us tell her story. Many years ago, when I was a first-year fellow, she was a wonderful little girl running around her grandparents' farm on vacation, chasing her baby sister, chasing the butterflies, petting the animals, and spending a wonderful summer until she got sick. And then she got really sick. She had a really sharp country doc who was able to ask the right questions, do the right tests, and realize that her body was being consumed by leukemia. She was so sick that her life was ebbing away just in front of their eyes. It was actually one of my first nights manning the phone at Johns Hopkins. And I remember that night working with that country doc, calling for emergency transport, getting her to a pediatric intensive care unit where doctors fought to save her life. She ended up needing a breathing tube. She ended up needing life support. She ended up needing neurosurgery to correct the tumor bursting into her brain so hard it nearly came out of her skull. 
But after a lot of hard work and many, many touch and go days, she was stable enough to return home to Johns Hopkins where we continued chemotherapy. And her T cell leukemia was under control for a couple of months. Came back. We immediately launched a second line of chemotherapy, new agents directed specifically against the T cell leukemia. After hard work on her part, we were able to get that back into control and then give her a bone marrow transplant from her matched sister to replace her sick marrow with her sister's matched own. And that kept the leukemia away for six months. Then the T cell leukemia came back. So she had been through intensive chemotherapy, and her T-cell leukemia came back. She had been through a perfect match bone marrow transplant from her sister, and the leukemia came back. Ten years ago, we would not have had anything else to offer, but. This is Professor Simons, one of my mentors at Johns Hopkins and herself, many years ago, an ALSF awardee. Her career had begun thanks to a Young Investigator Award just like mine. And the work that she did then, and work that she continued to do with other colleagues at Johns Hopkins, and with other scientists and colleagues all across the country, made possible a new generation of bone marrow transplants called haploidentical bone marrow transplants. Let's take a moment to talk about that. Bone marrow transplants traditionally are done from matched siblings, or matched donors, strangers, volunteers, an immune system that matches yours immunologically. There are disadvantages to that, however. The problem is, is that the reason why you got cancer in the first place was in part because the tumor figured out how to hide from your immune system. In you or me, whenever a cancer cell appears, our normal immune system cleans it up. That's why we don't get cancer a dozen times a day. When a tumor figures out how to trick your immune system, that's when it begins to spread. That's when it begins to grow. That's when it takes over. And so you give chemo, you can knock it down, the tumor comes back. You can do a bone marrow transplant with a matched immune system, but the tumor already figured out how to hide from you. It figures out pretty easily how to hide from the match. However, if you can figure out how to do a bone marrow transplant from someone who only half matches you, all of a sudden, the tricks that the tumor used to hide from your immune system and hide from the match transplant don't work anymore on that transplant that only half matches you. All those ways to hide don't work anymore. In addition, when you're using a half match transplant, the number of donors rises dramatically. After all, every child is half their mother, half their father. If you can do a transplant from a half match, that means every kid who has a parent potentially has a donor, and that's huge. So many of you heard the desperate searches for donors, the attempts to try to find someone out there who matches, the drives that people generously donate to so that maybe they can be the stranger that full matches. Well, if you do a half match, that gives so many more kids the life-saving chance. So all those things give you a new option. But when it came Grace's turn, Nobody had ever done a haploidentical match with booster shots to try to fight down a T cell leukemia that had already come back multiple times. We did a literature search. We talked to colleagues of ours all over the world. And people said, it seems like a really good idea. The logic, the science, it all makes sense. But nobody's ever done it. And there's side effects and there's challenges. But on the other hand, we were out of options. And so Grace and her family bravely decided to try. They felt that even if it didn't work, what we could learn from the experience might be able to help other kids moving forward. And so almost three years ago, she underwent the haploidentical transplant with donor lymphocyte infusion booster shots to try to fight off her recurrent T-cell leukemia. And this is Grace today. It's been three years. Ever since she left the hospital after her first transplant, she's only been in the hospital four additional days, two each for each of her booster shots. She's been back to school. She's been a big sister. She's been a ballerina. She comes to camp every summer, and we run around together. She loves butterflies and Disney princesses, and she's still trying to decide what she wants to do when she grows up. But that's exactly what she's going to get. 
the chance to grow up. And all of that because many, many years ago, the ALSF began making a series of investments in faculty members and in research that ultimately paid off. Thanks to the foundation, we had the opportunity to present her story to the world. We wrote a scientific paper, and our team includes three investigators, myself, Professor Simons, and Professor Schaefer, who all were supported by the foundation, and the work itself likewise. Now, when other doctors and other families face the same crisis that Grace's family did, they will find something. They will find a report, and they will have an option that could work for them as it did for Grace. But it's not just blood tumors that the ALSF has made a huge difference in individual patients of mine. This is Adam. Adam is now a running around rambunctious fourth grader who is now four years out from having a tumor that filled nearly half of his brain. On the left is Dr. Eric Rabb, professor. When I was a fellow, he was a professor who helped me take care of Adam. Eric originally also was a young investigator he was looking at ways to try to crack open DIPG, to try to look at different aspects of the human genome in ways that people haven't looked at before. And he made some amazing discoveries, discoveries that he is now advancing thanks to a second, larger grant from the ALSF. With those wards, he will hopefully be able to take those discoveries that he's made and turn them into cures. But together, we've been able to make a difference, you, us, together, for kids like Adam as well. So for all the kids we've been able to help, there are still too many kids we can't. How are we going to solve that? Well, we're going to try to solve that by taking the most revolutionary discoveries in human science and seeing if they can apply to the care of kids. That's the basic science that the LSF has enabled me to pursue. The idea is to use adult stem cells, adult pluripotent stem cells, to try to model pediatric cancers. Well, what does that actually involve? Let's talk about that. The specific cancer that I'm pursuing is retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma is one of the most common cancers of the eye, and it's one of those tumors that actually appears before birth. As the pediatrician, you go into the nursery, new babies, you count the toes, you count the fingers, and you check the eyes. Most of the time, you get a red reflex. You, know, you see the back of the retinas, you get those nice, reassuring red dots. But once in a very infrequent while, you don't see the red, you see white. You see white because the inside of the eye is filled with white tumor, retinoblastoma. It used to be uniformly fatal. There's been a lot of work to try to improve that. Now kids who have retinoblastoma, they go through chemotherapy, they go through radiation, they have laser therapy, cryotherapy. Many of them end up losing one eye. Others lose both. And even after all that, many do not survive. And the ones who even do survive, the therapy that they got gave them more cancer. Clearly, we need better answers. A lot of research has helped us understand more about where retinoblastoma comes from. All of you will remember from high school and from college, where do we come from? We come from a sperm and an egg form a cell, a cell called the pluripotent stem cell. That one cell has the ability to become the rest of us, from hair, eyes, skin, heart, and some of them become retinas. So from that original pluripotent stem cell, some of them become eye stem cells and then go through a series of steps and become a normal retina. We have learned that in retinoblastoma, something goes wrong with one particular gene called the RB1 gene. And when that mistake happens, something goes off the rails. That process that goes from the normal stem cell to the final retina breaks down and instead, of getting a beautiful retina with the ability to see in life in all its beautiful colors, you get this cancer. The question is, where? Where in this long drive from the original stem cell to the tumor, where does the process break down? If you can figure out where it broke down, you can figure out what happens there, you can make a drug for it. Not that simple. Next slide, please. The problem is, is, as I mentioned, retinoblastoma is one of those tumors that happen when you're born with it. So back one, please. The, so you're born with the cancer, which means that you can't watch it develop because, well, it's happening inside mother. 
You could perhaps watch it in mice, but it turns out mice don't actually get retinoblastoma the same way we do. For whatever reason, their biology is different enough that you don't get the same thing. So you can't watch it happen in the patients. You can't watch it happen in mice. But what if? What if there was some way we could watch it happen in a dish? What if we could actually make that happen inside, underneath a microscope, watch it day by day, and figure out where does it go wrong? And that's where next generation technology comes in. So it turns out that you can actually take a skin cell, a blood cell, the cell you know, take a piece of hair off and those little cells at the bottom there, you can actually turn them backwards into that very first original cell. You can take an adult cell and turn it backwards into that original pluripotent stem cell called an IPS cell and then turn them forward again into anything you want, heart, neurons, skin. That technology lets you basically take a patient's cells, turn them back to that pluripotent stem cell, turn them forward into anything you want. And that can do a lot of amazing things. For example, you could take a patient's skin cells, turn them back to an adult stem cell, and turn them forward into blood to help kids with blood cancers. Or many of these kids go through terrible amounts of chemo and their hearts get damaged. You could take a patient's blood cells, turn them back to an adult stem cell, turn them forward into new heart tissue and help repair their hearts. And together with colleagues of ours at the Wilmer Eye Institute, my mentor Elias Zambides was able to take blood cells, turn them back into adult stem cells and turn them forward into retinas. We can take this process, we can make retinas in a little dish, you can shine light on them and they make little electrical impulses just like real retinas do. So if you can make a normal retina from an adult stem cell, then maybe you can model the cancerous stem cells into retinoblastoma. And that is the project that the ALSF has provided me seed money to begin to pursue. Basically, we're working to turn the normal adult stem cell, introduce the mutation we know causes retinoblastoma, and then together with our colleagues at Wilmer, actually watch that whole process grow up. And basically, we're going to hope to see where retinoblastoma comes from. There are a lot of technical challenges, a lot of issues. With any new technology, there's a lot of groundwork that goes into it. But the foundation set here will provide the beginnings of many years of work, which, just like for Grace, will someday hopefully give us new answers. And the impact goes well beyond just retinoblastoma. Yes, we will develop new cures for that, but there are other tumors in kids and adults that involve the same gene. So if you learn something in retinoblastoma, it'll help lots of other kids with osteosarcomas, and it'll help adults too. Science is science. You learn a fact, it applies everywhere. And beyond that, the ability to engineer stem cells, the science that we gain from this process, will help us build other tissues to help other problems and other kids with cancer, as well as many other diseases. Again, science is science. And so the impact of all the support we get to fund one little thing ripples and ripples and ripples. And that is, leads to the kind of final point. People ask all the time, you know, what can one cup of lemonade do? A lot. Biology is a science where every little step adds forward, and each little step is really quite cheap. A single dish, little six-well dish of stem cells, costs $3.90. That's only a couple of cups of lemonade. A single immunofluorescence assay, another fundamental experiment, $9. That's a couple of cups of lemonade. A few cups of lemonade funds an experiment. A couple of those experiments become a data point. A couple of those data points become a figure. A couple of figures become a paper, a couple of papers becomes a cure. Every one of those cups of lemonade is one step up the mountain. Each step by itself doesn't look like much, but every single step gets you closer to the summit. That's how we're going to beat pediatric cancer. That's how one cup at a time you beat pediatric cancer, because you climb Mount Everest one step at a time, but you never go backwards. And so when people ask, what are those pins by? What are those ties by? What are those cups by? It buys a fact. You add up enough facts, you get a cure. We've done it before. We'll do it again. Thanks.
to all of you. And that leads to my last slide. I've told you stories about patients, but the last story is mine and my family's. This is my cousin Roy. 40 years ago, he was diagnosed with a brain tumor, and he was one of the first generation of kids to successfully survive. He was, his life was saved by an oncologist at the University of Michigan, the same oncologist who 30 years later will be my first teachers in pediatric oncology. The doctors who saved his life, who helped my family. I was inspired as a little boy to become a pediatric oncologist so that I could help other kids the same way that those doctors helped us. And that was all made possible because of many generous mentors, colleagues, and all of you who helped support my research, my training, and the opportunities that I had to make a difference for others. I'm just one investigator. There are thousands like me over the many years the foundation has been part of. And everything that we have done, everything we will do, is because of all of your generosity. You, us, all of us together, we will work until every cancer has a cure, until every kid can go home. And that's what we're here about, to fight and win this battle together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wall. We love hearing about your amazing research and how it's helping kids. Thank you, Liz and Jay, for showing us the impact Alex's Lemonade Sand Foundation is having on fighting can childhood cancer. And thank you to all of your support on making it happen. Together, we can find a cure. Please enjoy the rest of your evening. Help yourself to food and drinks. Dr. Ha, Liz, and Jay will be around to answer any questions. If you're interested in getting involved with Alex's, see any of the staff members and they can let you know about all of the exciting ways that you can support them. We hope you are inspired by the impact this organization is having on childhood cancer. Thank you again and have a great night.